you know, if people could see the truth of what is going on in the factory farming industry, it's not just the cruelty to the animals and the, the suffering that takes place to all these sentient creatures. Um, it's also the incredible environmental impact of it. Um, so I always do sort of go to bat when I, when I interact with environmentalists that are still eating meat, because mm. you, if you're really trying to reduce your carbon footprint, it's the simplest and easiest thing that you can do. It's cheaper than buying an electric car. So, you know, I drive an electric car, I have solar panels powering my home and our car. Um, but being vegan is something, you know, three times a day, everybody sits down and eats a meal. And it's so easy now to make that meal a, a meal that has no animal products in it. Season three of the Plant Strong podcast explores those Galileo moments where you seek to understand the real truth around your health and dare to see the world through a different lens. This season, we honor those courageous seekers who are paving the way for you and me. So grab your telescope, point it towards your future, and let's get Plant Strong I want to welcome you to the Plant Strong Podcast. I am your host, Rip Esselstyn, and I hope that your summers have been filled with lots of summer sweet corn, kale, and pickleball. Today, I want to introduce you to a real hero. She's a biologist, race car driver, and eco activist. And her name is Leilani Munter. Now, it's no secret that our population is now fastly approaching 8 billion people and that we are facing a tremendous amount of collective challenges, not only with our health, but with our food system and our planet as a whole. And I bring this up not to frighten or threaten, but to provide hope for you, me, my children, and yours. We all have work to do. And much like my conversation last week with Gene Bauer, which provided insight into the beneficial work of farm sanctuaries, this week's interview with Leilani will illuminate and elevate the positive impact that something so simple as eating a whole foods plant-based diet can have on our environment as a whole. And here's the really cool thing. Leilani has been broadcasting this message for over a decade, primarily from behind the wheel of a race car. I know not exactly where you'd think you'd see this message, but as she loves to say, never underestimate a vegan hippie chick with a race car. And believe me, You'll never underestimate Leilani after hearing today's conversation. Now, since retiring from race car driving in 2019, Leilani has been revving up her advocacy engines even more through documentary films like Racing Extinction, which was directed by Luis Sahoyas, who also did the Game Changers that almost everybody listening to this podcast I know has heard of. She also has been doing a lot of keynote speaking and tremendous amounts of nonprofit work, all in a tireless effort to make a cleaner and kinder world for all of us. And if you enjoyed today's conversation, you can hear Leilani speak live at our virtual plant stock event. It's happening September 8th to the 12th. It'll be online and streaming live from the Esselstyn Family Farm. She'll join your favorite Brock stars like my parents, Ananesi, Dr. Michael Greger, Dr. Michael Clapper, Dr. Christy Funk, Dean and Aisha Scherzai, Dr. Will Bolshewitz, Dr. Alan Desmond, and so many others to help you start or strengthen your path to becoming plant strong. You can purchase a bundle of five tickets and get each ticket for just 10 bucks a piece by visiting plantstrong.com slash plantstock to see the up-to-date lineup 
and purchase your tickets for our 10th, yes, 10th anniversary plant stock celebration. Okay, let's buckle up our seatbelts, start your engines, and let me introduce you to a true eco hero, Leilani Munter. You know, it's interesting. So I've had the podcast now for a little over three years and uh, probably done well over 110, 120 episodes. And we, ha- we have people on for, you know, like James Wilkes that's talking about why you want to eat plant-based for performance. And my father and T. Colin Campbell and Neil Barnard and others talking about why you want to eat this way for health. Um, and people like Gene Bauer right? Um, from the farm sanctuary, why you want to eat this way for compassion and, and uh, for kindness and the animals. Um, but we haven't had that many people talking about the environment. I mean, I had Susie, Susie Amos Cameron, you know, mm-hmm. who's very, very much behind this. But, uh, you know, I love the fact that you have planted that stake firmly in the ground that, listen, I am a hardcore environmentalist, and these are the reasons why, you know, I, I, I eat this way and what we should be doing in our lives. So I want to talk about all that. But before before we do, I, I just want to know from you. Um, so tell me a little bit about your parents and life growing up, because I think that that is that's got to be an important part of how you've become who you are. Yeah, so I grew up in Minnesota. In fact, I just came back from um, visiting my mom up in Minnesota for the first time since the pandemic hit. And uh, my mother was a hypertension nurse. She's retired now. And my father was a neurologist. Um, So Rochester, Minnesota is very well known for the Mayo Clinic being there, and they both worked there. Um, So I came sort of from a medical family, and um, I went on to earn my degree in biology. And, uh, you know, I really wanted to be a marine biologist. And then I got into a race car, and it sort of took me on a detour. (laughs) (laughs) So, (laughs) so you that was, that was really the reader's digest version right there. But, but tell me this. Um, so growing up and your mother is what Japanese and Hawaiian. Is that correct? She's born and raised in Hawaii and she's full Japanese descent. Um, unfortunately by the time I was born, they, she had married my father and they lived in Germany for some time. My eldest sister was born in Berlin And uh, then my dad and mom both got jobs at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So they moved to Minnesota. So unfortunately, I got the Hawaiian name, um, but I got to grow up in the very cold Minnesota and did not ever visit Hawaii until I was um, until I was about 12 years old. I guess I was there as a baby, but I can barely remember that. Um, so when I saw Hawaii, you can imagine, I was like, wait, why do we live in Minnesota? <laughs> what, uh, what does Leilani stand for in Hawaiian? So Leilani is actually a very common name in Hawaii, which was so strange for me growing up in Minnesota and then getting to Hawaii and being in the grocery store and hearing other people calling other Leilani's. It was very confusing to me. Um, So Lei lei means um, flower. So when you get to Hawaii and they they put the lei around your neck, lei means flower and lani means heavenly. So together the word means heavenly flower. Beautiful, beautiful name. Uh, um, so <clears throat> growing up, what like were you were you a tomboy? What what kind of a, a, a girl were you? I was definitely a tomboy. Um, I played football and soccer and I rode horses and I really liked being outside. I always had a love of animals, um, being around horses, you know, we would board our horses at farms that also had other animals. So I think that was one of the seeds that was planted in my head that, you know, farm animals are not unlike uh, the pets that we have at home, like cats and dogs that have emotional bonds, and they look forward to seeing you and they all have their own little personalities. Um, So I think getting to grow up and interacting with some farm animals in Minnesota made me look at them in a different way. I think 
a lot of people in the world these days never get to interact with farm animals and you know they just think of them as being food um they don't get to interact that's why i think what gene bauer's done with farm sanctuary is so wonderful i've stayed up at his um his farm in uh new york a couple of times i went um, first for the celebration for the turkeys. Um, and then we went for one of the hoedowns that they had. <laughs> and, um, you know, that is a really life changing thing, I think, for people to interact and to realize that these animals are, are not so different from the, the dogs and the cats that, you know, people have as companion animals. Yeah, no, I had Gene on the podcast recently. And, um, it is just, it's so powerful how he talks about how, you know, as you just mentioned, we, we kind of look at animals as food and not as beautiful, wonderful creatures that, you know, deserve a life just like we deserve a beautiful life. And just kind of the way the culture is right now by, you know, living our lives kind of with our eyes closed and our head in the sand, we, it kind of removes one of the greatest characteristics that makes us as humans humans and that's our empathy and um and so that that is something that i think we all could get a little bit more of in 2021 <laughs> absolutely and actually there's a fun um behind the scenes story about gene bauer he actually started farm sanctuary um, selling vegan hot dogs at the Grateful Dead shows. And my big sister is married to Bob Weir from the Grateful Dead. So when the Grateful Dead were doing their um, final 50th shows, uh, Gene and I teamed up and we helped get uh, veggie dogs into the stadiums that uh, oh. the Grateful Dead played at in Santa Ana, California, and then Chicago. Um, and I think you just did, did an interview with my sister and my brother-in-law because my sister recently um, went vegan. And so she wanted to talk about that. She's, you know, I kind of, I think I bugged her for about nine years yeah. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and, you know, something clicked in her and she's gone vegan as well. So um, yeah, Jean and I have a little bit of a, of a history together through the Grateful Dead. When, so when was that, that, you got them to sell vegan hot dogs at that concert. Do you know what year that was? I think that was 2015. They played oh. at Soldiers Field in Chicago. Um, and then they also played a couple of shows out in California. Um, so yeah, it was wonderful. And you know, a lot of the stadiums, you don't even really have to work at getting that happening because they're, it's already now being sold on a regular basis, which is absolutely fantastic. I would love to see the NASCAR races do that. Um, the last three years of my career, I was running a vegan themed car and we had a big tent and we were giving away free vegan hamburgers. And, um, you know, it'd be great if we didn't have to do that. And there was already vegan options just sort of built into the stadiums. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I want to, I want to get to all that for sure. Right. Um, but you so so growing up, you know, horseback riding. You also mentioned football, which which doesn't sound like a very you know, for the most part, female sport. Uh, how did that go for you? And did you get much ridicule? Well, I was just playing with the neighborhood kids. It wasn't okay. really anything like official. <laughs> I did gymnastics as well. Um, I ju I just always was I think drawn to games that were more oriented towards boys. Um, I remember my uncle coming over and I was playing an Atari game of some sort. And he made the comment of like, it looks like a boy lives here. I have, there's four daughters in our family. So we're a family of lots of women. And um, I don't know, I was just, I would gravitate towards that. And I really didn't know how much I love speed until later when I got to start you know, driving a car and realize that I really love speed and that that adrenaline rush. I think adrenaline is an addictive, an addictive drug. <laughs> and once I felt it, I was really attracted to it. So that's how I ended up, you know, falling down that that rabbit hole. Yeah. Well, so you you so you got a need for speed. Um, but is that something that could you get that same kind of rush like riding a bicycle or driving your parents car and going fast on the freeway or 
or are we just, is this a whole nother level? It's a whole nother level. I mean, you are going, you know, near 200 miles an hour within inches of other cars. When I drove in the open wheel cars, in fact, we were, our entry speeds were higher than 200 miles an hour. So the, the level of concentration um, of being able to focus 100% where, where really sort of the whole world disappears and it's just you and the race car and the racetrack. It's very distracting when you're at the racetrack because you know, there's media there and they're filming and there's sponsors there. And usually some of my family members would be there and there's lots of people saying hello and you're kind of being pulled in all these different directions. Um, but somehow, you know, when I would put the helmet on and, and put the net up, yeah. um, all of that just completely faded and I could get, you know, really lost in just me and the race car. And that's, what you have to do, you really have to tune everything else out. I like to describe it to people who haven't gotten to experience it that, you know, some people describe if they've been in a car accident or they've almost been in an accident that they see everything in slow motion. So that is what happens when I'm in the race car. So even though we're going, you know, 200 miles an hour, to me, in my brain, it looks very slow because we're all going 200 miles an hour. And I think your brain, in order to be able to process all the information of those split second decisions that you're having to make, I think the brain compensates by slowing everything down. And so it feels slow. And it was, you know, kind of funny, I would turn on like Fox Sports and watch my race. And, you know, I'd look at how fast we were going in real time. And I'm like, geez, we're really going fast. But it doesn't feel like that from inside the car. It's really kind of a beautiful feeling. Mm -hmm. The only other place that I feel like I've been able to get that feeling is um, I'm a scuba diver. Uh Um, And there's something about when you drop down in the ocean, the world also sort of seems to slow down. Everything's a little bit calmer underneath the water. And that same calmness is something that I would feel in the race car, even though it it sounds counterintuitive. It sure does. (laughs) Right. It should be chaos. Um, But I think when you are, are in the zone, so to speak, um, it actually feels, I, I feel that sense of really calm and slowness in the race car. Yeah. It's interesting how, you have to speed up to kind of slow down. Um, Wow. All right, my cruciferous cousins, I have a favor to ask of you. If you happen to live near a Whole Foods market store, I want you to swing by and see if you can find on the shelves all of our new vegetable broths and ready to eat chilies and stews. This new national rollout for Plant Strong Foods is a milestone that the Plant Strong team has been working on for over two years, and it is finally, finally happening. The trucks have left the distribution centers, and across the country, Whole Food Market team members are now making room on the shelf for our slow simmered vegetable broth, our shiitake mushroom broth our Spanish-style sofrito broth, and our sweet corn broth. They're also stocking the return of the Engine 2 Firehouse Chili, plus the all-new creamy white bean chili, the Indian lentil stew, and Thai carrot chickpea stew. Let me know if you find them. I would love it if you would take a photo, share it on social, and tag Go Plant Strong so we can see where our new products are located. And if you want to try them, go ahead, go for it. You're not going to find a cleaner, great tasting vegetable broth or chili or stew on the market that's oil free and has no added sugar with lower sodium. Thank you so much. And then, and then your love for the, for the oceans um, and scuba diving. When, when did that start? So I started scuba diving in high school. And actually, when I went to school for biology at UC San Diego, 
Um, the reason that I took biology is I wanted to bring, be a marine biologist. And my dream was, you know, to be out in the ocean, um, studying dolphins and studying whales. And I think as time went on, I realized more and more that those were very difficult and unusual jobs to get in that world. And more than likely, I was, as a biologist, going to end up working in a lab, staring at Petri dishes and doing something that might, you know, not be as um, engaging as being out in the ocean. Um, yeah. So I kept that, you know, I, I, I kept scuba diving. I usually try and take a trip once a year um, to some place where we can scuba dive. Since the pandemic, I was supposed to go on a scuba diving trip in March 2020. And of course, we had to cancel that um, due to COVID. And so I haven't been now um, since the pandemic began, but I really miss it. And I retired from racing in 2019. So you know, sometimes I just need that adrenaline. There was a time where um, a couple months after I retired from racing, I was like, I need to get that adrenaline. And we just, we went skydiving. Mm -hmm. um, so I think once you felt that kind of intense adrenaline, um, it's a hard thing to replace. It really I, is. I, 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 can't, I can't even imagine, uh, or I can, but not racing cars. Um, I mean, you must've felt that fighting fires. The, the, there's you, sure, you sure. must have that same sort of you're going into the unknown and you're having your body is having a real reaction of like fight or flight um so I'm, i know you know what that feeling that i'm talking about yes ab absolutely fighting fires i also you know i was a uh an athlete for for a long time and uh did a lot of mountain biking and so mountain biking to me is it's similar in that when you're on these trails and these downhills and these ledges, one of the things I love about it is like you said, kind of when you put that helmet on and I think you said the net goes down, everything else just disappears. It's the same way because if you're not hundred percent focused, you are like, you actually, the beautiful thing is you have no choice, but to right. be hundred percent focused. Right? right. So it almost, it, you put yourself in that environment to allow kind of the world to slow down and have everything that's in your mind just kind of like evaporate away. Yep. It's kind of nice. Yeah. Um, so what I, what I would love to know is, you know, in doing my research, it looks like you've been a vegetarian for almost all your life. Is, is that, is that right? Yeah. I went vegetarian at a pretty young age when I, I remember actually I can, I can see the moment I was sitting at a Wendy's with my mom um, in Rochester, Minnesota, and I was eating a hamburger and I asked her what it was made of. And she told me it was, you know, that it came from a cow. And I said, sort of like how cheese and milk comes from a cow. And she said, no, you know, it's part of the cow. <laughs> right. And when I realized what she was saying, that it was like a piece of dead flesh from the cow, I remember you know, putting my hamburger down and being sort of horrified about it. Yeah. Um, I did not go vegan. I just celebrated my 10 year vegan anniversary. So I went vegan on um, July 10th, 2011. And so we actually went up to New York and we went to 11 Madison Park, which oh. is the three Michelin star oh. place that just reopened completely vegan. And that was, I, I sort of make a bigger deal about my vegan anniversary than I do my regular birthday. Like I call it my vegan birthday. And, you know, it means more to me because it was something that I chose and, you know, my husband went vegan with me. So it was, you know, really us trying to live what we felt was ethical and moral and we didn't want to hurt animals and you know we try to be good to the planet and reduce our carbon footprint as much as we can and um so when we made that decision you know i put it on my calendar and every year i celebrate it normally i just get like a you know vegan cupcake and i stick a candle in it um but it being the big 10 year anniversary this year we decided to go big and also, we hadn't been traveling because of the pandemic, so it was a big deal to make our first trip to New York. Um, and yeah, you know, Forks Over Knives was probably a, a, a piece of that, um, but it was also just discovering what was going on in the, the milk industry, the dairy industry, the cruelty that takes place there, the cruelty that takes place in the egg industry. Um, 
that made me sort of take that next step of, you know, being a vegetarian wasn't good enough anymore. Yeah. How in the world did you get into 11 Madison Avenue? How, how did, how did that happen? Oh, who I, do you, who do you know? <laughs> no, I didn't. I, I didn't make any special phone calls. What I did was when I found out about 11 Madison Park going vegan, yeah. you know, it was a pretty big deal. It was on everyone's newsfeed. It was in all the papers and, and then I kind of put it together. Oh, it's our 10 year. Maybe this could be our celebration. So I called the restaurant and they told me, you know, the first of every month, is when we release the reservations for the following month. Um, so it was June 1st that they released all of their July reservations and I needed reservations on July 10th. So sh she said, you know, 9 a.m., the only way you can book a table is to go on our website, do it right at 9 a.m. on the 1st. So I had an alarm, I, was, I had my computer open, I had my iPhone next to me in case anything <laughs> went wrong with my computer. I was waiting for the button to turn blue to book now. Yeah. Um, and then the second it hit nine o'clock, I clicked on it, selected July 10th. I'm talking within seconds and I selected seven, all booked up, 7.30, 8, 8.30, 9, 9.30. They were all already taken. I mean, I'm telling you this is within a minute of the reservations being released. Yeah. yeah. I got us in for the final reservation, which is at 10 o'clock. Um, but then you, you enter all your credit card information and it takes you back to the main page and the whole month was sold out within minutes. It was absolutely crazy. I felt like I had gotten tickets to like the last Rolling Stone concert. <laughs> or, or Grateful Dead. Right. Well, what's incredible about that is, I mean, I, you know, what I hear is that the waiting list is 15,000 people. I didn't know that it renewed the first of every month, which is, which is interesting. I think we'll have to take out this little segment where we talked about this so that there's less people trying to call on the first of the month. <laughs> <laughs> right. So that you can get in. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Well, so, okay. So that's real. Bravo to you for treating yourself to 11 Madison Park. How was it? It was amazing. I mean, just absolutely fantastic. And, you know, I don't, I, I don't know that I've ever been to a three Michelin star place before. I don't think I have. Um, so it wasn't that I could compare it to another very fancy meal like that, but it was absolutely incredible. I mean, they had a dish that was um, a beet dish that was cooked in a clay pot for like three days. Yeah. And then they come to your table and they break open the clay pot at your table. It's just, it's just incredible. And everything looked like a piece of art. So mm -hmm. you almost, you know, you, of course I was taking pictures of every single <laughs> dish that came out yeah. um but you know yeah it was everything was so beautifully displayed you know that you can tell they're they're sort of decorating it with tweezers yeah yeah well he's he's done an amazing amazing job and the, and the transformation that happened because of covid there um you know what a what a testament to um uh just um his name's Daniel, right? Yeah, the, Daniel. Daniel. Whom? Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. Daniel, and just you know, uh, what he was. I think they were making. They made like two or three million like meals that they were giving away to people in need. Yeah. And what came out of that whole experience? And the and fact, they, that they, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say they still have that food truck that's going around and and giving free meals, and so for every meal that they sell at 11 Madison Park. Um, each of those meals provides for five more meals that they give away for free out of the truck. It's really, it's really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Inspiring. Um, you know, you mentioned your, your mother when you were, I think, was it a Burger King or McDonald's where she mentioned it was a Wendy's. A Wendy's. A Wendy's. I, I can right. still see the table that we were sitting at. Like it was a traumatic experience. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. You know, as I think I had this naive idea that it was okay to eat dairy and eggs because I didn't dive into what was going on there. And in my head, I thought, well, they're not killing the cow to get the milk. Um, but it was fairly easy switch for me because there's so many 
you know, vegan plant-based milks. Um, there's so many things that you can substitute eggs for. It really wasn't hard to make that switch and it becomes easier and easier every day because of all of the incredible, you know, vegan options that are being offered now. In fact, when I was in Minnesota visiting my mom just over last weekend, the first place that I went when I landed in Minneapolis was a new vegan fried chicken place called Irby's Butcher's Fried Chicken. Yeah. It's made by the people that do the herbivorous butcher. Oh, yeah. And it's, you know, it's like Kentucky Fried Chicken, but completely vegan. And it was wonderful. And I bought two big buckets of vegan fried chicken and brought it down to my family in Rochester to share with everyone. <laughs> share the love. <laughs> Um, Probably not the healthiest of vegan meals. Yeah. Um, so I can be a little bit of a junk food vegan sometimes, but sure. it was delicious. Yeah, yeah. Well, but the reason I go, I go back to that moment at Wendy's when your mother said, well, it's actually part of a cow is, is because um, I noticed on your Instagram, you had a, a post that really makes you think. And, and you said 30,000 different edible plants and you all eat the same five dead animals, chicken, fish, um, cow, pig, and I think it's goat. I mean, it, it just, it really makes you stop in your tracks and think, like, right. what, are we, what are we, what are we thinking here? Please, really? Yeah, it's just, it's so unnecessary. And I think, um, you know, if people could see the truth of what is going on in the factory farming industry, it's not just the cruelty to the animals and the, the suffering that takes place to all these sentient creatures. Um, it's also the incredible environmental impact of it. Um, so I always do sort of go to bat when I when I interact with environmentalists that are still eating meat, because mm. you if you're really trying to reduce your carbon footprint, it's the simplest and easiest thing that you can do. It's cheaper than buying an electric car. So, you know, I drive an electric car, I have solar panels powering my home and our car. Um, but being vegan is something, you know, three times a day, everybody sits down and eats a meal. And it's so easy now to make that meal a, a meal that has no animal products in it. And I feel like every time I I turn around, there's a new vegan product that's hitting the market. It's incredible how much is out there. I truly, you know, I've been doing it for 10 years now, but when I talk to people like Moby, for example, who's been vegan for like over 40, 30 years, yeah. I think back to how much harder it must have been 30 years ago to do this. They didn't have vegan Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They didn't have you know, vegan mac and cheese. They didn't have all of these very easy, you know, you can just go to the store and get the the vegan coffee creamer. Um, so I really admire people that did it back then when it was so hard. Now it's just, it's so easy. It's a, it's a kale walk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. A kale yeah. walk. Yeah. Um, <sighs> So I had Ethan Brown on the podcast in season two, right? The CEO of Beyond, Beyond Meat. Beyond Meat. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Ethan, he, he, he started Beyond Meat for really one singular purpose. And that was because he, he felt that the number one kind of threat to humanity was um, what's going on with climate pollution, climate change and all that, mm -hmm. right? And because of the carbon footprint that you know, us eating animal products has on the planet. What, what was your kind of like motivation or aha moment for being, I mean, an environmentalist, which to me seems to supersede everything that, that you do now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I think really the veganism initially stemmed from the animal cruelty um, that was the first thing that made me, I, I love animals and I don't want to hurt them. Then as I became more educated about the environment as time went on and saw, you know, all of these issues that we're facing, that humanity is facing with the environment, habitat destruction, pollution, ocean acidification, loss of biodiversity, species extinction, which this documentary here, Racing Extinction, that I worked on for four years is- With Luis Sahoyas. 
Yes, with Louie, I'm on the board of OPS, so we work together closely. And, you know, this movie is really about the six mass extinction of species that we are living through now. Um, scientists call this era the, the, this era the Anthropocene, which really translates to the age of man. It's where our human impact on the planet is so great that we're, we're changing the fossil record of the future because so many animals are dying off due to our impact. Um, so we're, mm -hmm. we're making species go extinct at a rate that's about a thousand times faster than the natural background rate of extinction. And so in our call to actions in the film, you know, I, I drive this really cool Tesla in the film um, that has a big projection system in it where I, I was projecting, you know, endangered species onto the sides of buildings and things like that. Um, but we also talk quite a bit about the impact of the meat and dairy industry. And, you know, I think more and more because of movies like Racing Extinction, there was also Cowspiracy, movies that are making the connection between our human impact and how we eat um, and how, you know, you multiply that by, we're at nearly 8 billion people on the planet now. When oh I was born in 1974, there were 4 billion people on the planet. While our growth rate is currently adding a net growth of approximately a million people every four and a half days, approximately 81 million people every year, and that amounts to about a billion more people every 12 years. So every single impact that we make as humans is being multiplied by billions. And it's just not sustainable. We are currently using up Earth's resources, the natural resources that the Earth can replenish. You know, we're using it up by July that the Earth can replenish in a whole year. They call it Earth Overshoot Day, mm -hmm. where they're keeping track of, you know, how much natural resources we're taking from the Earth and how much that the Earth can replenish in one year. We're every single year it gets moved back earlier and earlier in the year, the, the day that we hit earth overshoot day. Um, so, so I just, it's, it's for me, the number one easy thing that people can do to reduce their carbon footprint because buying an electric car, you know, that costs more money. Not everybody has a roof to put solar panels up on. They might be in a condo or an apartment complex or their house doesn't, you know, have a good south facing roof like we have. Um, and it's expensive. It's an investment to, you know, go electric and go solar. Whereas veganism, you can make that decision any day and it doesn't take a big investment up front financially to make that choice. In fact, you're you're going to save money over time. You know, not not if you're going to 11 Madison Park every evening, but sure. <laughs> as long as you're not doing that, um, I think. I think the a vegan diet is, you know, very reasonable. I don't know where this idea came from that veganism is expensive because I, I don't think that's true if you look at the prices of meat and dairy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you or if you look at the prices of beans and bananas and potatoes, uh, and you know, um, you know, if you can't afford like let's just say fresh organic you can do frozen our our freezers loaded mm -hmm. with frozen vegetables and fruits uh, to the gills so yeah you're right so um you mentioned that we're on you know we're approaching eight billion people on planet earth um i know that you are child free mm -hmm. and you uh and people may not know what that term means i'd love for you to explain it but also um, that you are part of the kind of population matters movement. Can you talk about that for a sec? Yes. So population matters is a group out of the UK um, that uh, talks about the human impact of human population growth. And I'm a patron of theirs alongside some amazing people like Sir David Attenborough and Dr. Jane Goodall, who I just had a zoom with last week. She's so amazing and inspiring. Um, but I first got interested or became aware of the human population uh, issue back in college. I had a biochemistry professor at UC San Diego that 
one day I turned up for class and he just told everyone to close our books and we weren't going to talk about biochemistry that day. And he set aside a class to show us a film about population. Mm -hmm. And I remember, you know, I was probably 20, 21 years old. And I remember just thinking, I can't believe this issue has never been discussed with me before. I was so into recycling and, you know, trying to be a good steward of the planet, but no one had ever brought that issue to, to my attention before. And so I walked, I remember walking with the professor all the way across campus talking about it and just sort of shocked at this is the driving force behind all of our other environmental issues. It's accelerating everything else. The more people that are consuming and wanting meat and wanting cell phones and wanting all these things, um, you know, the, the more habitat destruction we will have, the more loss of biodiversity, all of it, we have less time to solve with more people. Um, and I didn't talk about it for quite some time just because it is such a, uh, it's a volatile issue. It's an emotional issue. People get very defensive. It's such a personal choice. Um, and the turning point for me was actually when Racing Extinction came out, I was doing a screening for this in Vail, Colorado. And it, it was a strange screening in that I was the only member of the cast of the film that was there. So I was on stage alone in front of about 750 people that had just watched the film. And when I went up to do my Q&A, the first question that was asked, is there is there anything in the film that wasn't addressed that you wish had been addressed? And of course, my answer was population because we never, I think there's some subtle suggestions of it, but we never actually directly talk about that issue. And when I said that, I saw about two thirds of the people kind of shake their heads in agreement, like, oh yes, we need to talk about this. And then about a third of the people, the body language kind of got, you know, defensive. They kind of sat back and crossed their arms. I could feel that, you know, it, it, it definitely, you could feel who was okay with this discussion and who wasn't. Um, and then I spoke just a couple of weeks later in Aspen at a renewable energy event. And I kind of threw out my whole speech and said, I, I just want to talk about population. And I was so encouraged by the number of people that came over to say thank you for bringing up this issue that most of us think about all the time, but we don't bring up because we don't want to offend anyone. Um, so the way that I was kind of bringing this up to people in a, in a friendly way, um, pre-pandemic, of course, when I was traveling a lot more and I was sitting on a lot more airplanes, um, and oftentimes one of the first or second questions that people ask is, do you have children? And I learned to, to sort of answer that by saying, no, actually my husband and I are child free by choice. And by answering with just those two extra words at the end, child free by choice, I feel like that invited a conversation. And oftentimes I would, you know, have a great discussion with somebody because it let them know it wasn't that I was child free because I, I wanted to have kids and maybe I couldn't, maybe there was a biological reason why I couldn't get pregnant or something like that. It let them know that it was like a conscious choice and decision on our part. And that would often, you know, spur the question of like, oh, that's interesting. Why? <laughs> and I had a lot of really great discussions that way. And I do think that more and more, the more and more people are willing to talk about the issue and the more women that come out and say, I'm child free by choice or men and, and discuss why, um, the more accepted it will be and the less judged, you know, we will feel. Cause I think there is sort of a stigma around it. Um, and I think the only way we can sort of bring it into normality is to talk about it. I, I was actually going to bring this up with the, the vegan strong car and your plant strong podcast. Cause when, um, yeah. when you guys reached out to me, the first thing that struck me was we were initially going to call our car plant strong. Really? <laughs> and we were weighing out, should we use the word vegan yeah. or should we use the word plants and, we had all these meetings about it to figure out what we were going to do. And at the end of the day, we were like, 
let's make them say the word vegan on Fox sports. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we put plastered vegan all over the car and it was so fun yeah. to watch my race afterwards and hear, you know, <laughs> these NASCAR guys in the, in the NASCAR booth, the Fox sports booth saying, you know, the vegan strong car. And I went out and tried one of those vegan burgers and it was pretty good. And these are, you know, I guess there's a stereotype of the NASCAR uh, audience. And um, it was really fun to sort of normalize it. And I think in the same way that I'm trying to normalize um, the child free movement, and that it's okay to make that choice. I was also trying to normalize the word vegan being at a NASCAR track. <laughs> yeah. There's this big societal sort of expectation of it. And, and it, yeah, we need and to normalize that it's okay to have one or have none. Yeah. And that it's acceptable, right? Yep. Yep. No, absolutely. And I guess in some ways, you know, we're, we're kind of fighting that evolutionary, you know, I guess, desire for procreation, right? Right. I mean, in some ways, I guess at the, at the most fundamental level, we're put here to <laughs> procreate. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which would be okay if we had multiple planets that could yeah. provide for 8 billion people or 10 billion people. There was an interesting study that was done by ecologists. Um, I can't remember which university. It might have been Cambridge, I think. And the ecologists wanted to figure out what is the carrying capacity for planet Earth. And mm. this was assuming that everyone in the population would... Um, not be living in poverty. So everyone would have electricity and clean access to clean water. So this would assume, you know, this beautiful situation where nobody would be living in a, in a struggling situation and in poverty. And the number that they came up with was 2 billion. So, you know, according to that study, we're, we're about 6 billion people past <laughs> <laughs> the carrying capacity. And that can change certainly with technology. Um, you know, like I've been driving an electric car since 2013 and we've got the solar on our house and you, there's all these things that can help us reduce our individual carbon footprints, but it's going to take a long time for us to make those switches. I mean, you know, electric cars are becoming very popular, but it's still, when you look at the percentage of the overall cars in the world, the number that are electric is very, very small, even though it's growing rapidly. And, you know, you know what, do you know what that percentage is? Like what percent are electric? Any idea? I do not know. I mean, I would say less than 5%. Let's right. look it up. Right. This is what we have Google for, right? <laughs> yes, it is. Um, <laughs> you know, you're probably, so would you say you're super, uh, happy with how far we've come in the last seven, eight years with electric cars, or do you think it's still not enough? I mean, I mean, because I, then let me, let me stop you for a sec because yeah. in, in 2013, you wrote a great article in the Huffington post, um, you know, why we need to fight for Tesla. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, and basically it looked like, I mean, Tesla was, I mean, they broke down barriers. What a huge disruptor. And now it seems like everyone's going electric, right? Or at least hybrid. Um, yeah. I mean, it, Tesla really forced the other legacy manufacturers to go electric because Tesla was starting to steal their customers. Yeah. So I, I feel like, you know, they deserve the credit for sort of shifting the, the paradigm and, and tipping the scale towards electric. Um, so I'm happy in that sense because every single manufacturer is now going electric. Solar has gotten a lot cheaper. You know, I, I think veganism gives me a lot of hope. There's more and more vegans every year, it seems like. Um, there, there's a great study that was done um, about the tipping point for ideas. I don't know if you've heard about the 10% tipping point. Sure. Sure. Yes. Uh, so, so the scientists wanted to figure out, is there a tipping point for a, a, an idea in a society? And what they found was that if just 10% of a society has an unwavering belief in an idea, it's actually inevitable that the rest of the society will adopt that idea. I feel like we've hit 10% definitely for veganism. I think we're getting closer with electric cars. Um, and I think, you know, 
with all of the drastic weather events that we're having, what we're seeing happening to our natural world, I think everybody sort of gets that climate change is real now, whereas 10 years ago, we would have been mm -hmm. arguing with politicians over whether it was even happening. And now the arguments are more about like, what do we do about it? How do we respond? What are the solutions? Where do we pour the money into? Is it, is it carbon sequestration? Is it renewable energy? Is it electric cars? And um, so it, I feel a lot of hope because it seems like people are waking up is it enough soon enough? Is it a little too late? Um, I do worry about that. You know, just a few weeks ago, it was 118 degrees in the, in, in the Arctic circle, the permafrost is melting. That's releasing, you know, tons of methane into the air, which as you know, is, is more heat trapping than carbon dioxide. Um, so it feels like we're teetering on that tipping point. I feel like we're, but we, we have to act now and we have to always, I think, keep that hope that it's not too late. Otherwise uh, we would give up. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, no, it is getting scary. Oh, it's, it's, <laughs> yeah, to me, it's beyond scary. It's, uh, it's like, we've got a, uh, a five alarm fire that's going off right now. And we, we need to, uh, respond to it with everything that we have. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, um, I think as, as you stated in one of your, your Instagram posts recently, we're, we're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be optimistic, but occasionally yeah. like the pessimist in me <laughs> comes out in yeah. the, I feel like in the morning, I'm very positive. <laughs> and then by the end of the day, after I've read all the bad news, I'm like sort of more, oh, how can we solve this? But then somehow in the morning I get up and I feel optimistic again. But speaking of fires, the fire in Oregon, when I left uh, Charlotte to go visit my family in Minnesota, we had smoke mm. from the wildfires in Oregon and Northern California and Canada had actually come all the way here to Charlotte. And our, I, I remember kind of, I felt like I was smelling smoke and I was sitting in my living room. I was like, what is that? And then I looked outside and the whole sky was just white. And it was, it, you know, it was, the sun was not like the bright sun that you're normally seeing. There was this haze. Yeah. And sure enough, it was, you know, I watched this satellite image that um, uh, NOAA had put out and you see the wildfire smoke making it all the way across our country. So I feel like you know, these things of it landing in your backyard and realizing, wow, I'm breathing smoke from the West Coast is hopefully waking up people and making them realize how real this is and how much of a true emergency that we're in. That, it, you know, the scientists have been warning us about this for decades, but now it feels like it's landing in everybody's backyard, the heat wave in the Northwest where a lot of people don't have air conditioning and it was like 118 up there. Yep. Um, China, I, I, in, right. I know the droughts there that, uh, the flood you know, in Germany. Yep. 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 No, everybody, everybody on the planet is feeling the effects one way or the other. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and we have to, we have to collectively kind of get our arms around this, I think get our, our arms around each other yeah. and, 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 and dive in and do everything that we, that we can um, collectively and as individuals to, to mitigate this, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. It's as, as sad as it is to see all these things happening. I feel like that's sort of what was needed in order for people to wake up. They needed to be directly affected by it. It couldn't be this, idea that you know oh in 10 20 years this is going to be an emergency it it needed to feel like an emergency right now and it does feel like that's happening this this year last year and this year with the pandemic and just our abuse of nature is really coming back to bite us mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep literally um i i want to go back now and revisit just some of the race car stuff because i'm really fascinated with that what what is it 
because you, you know, you were in that hot seat, you raced for, was it over a, almost a decade, right? 2001 was my first oh, wow. race. Okay. And then I retired after Daytona 2019. I ran the uh, what the health car in my final race at Daytona. Wow. And I had a great time, but I was ready to walk away. You know, my body couldn't take 200 mile an hour hits as well anymore. So, so, um, I want to ask you some questions about being a race car driver. And I'm going to kind of throw these, fire these off at you. So, what is it that makes a guy like, like Lewis Hamilton, like so, so amazing, you know, besides the fact that he is vegan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And he credits, I think he credits oh, he his, yeah. his formula one, his most recent formula one championship to being vegan. I mean, he's been in a, I think he's been in a race car or a go-kart since he was a little kid. So it's, it's almost like the race car is like an extension of his body. Um, he's, you know, I, I didn't start racing until, you know, my college years. So I was much older. Um, and I, and I think he's just also a, a natural talent. Um, a certain amount of it is experience of feeling what a race car is doing and being able to describe that to your crew chief so that he can make the changes in the race car to make you more comfortable and making the car go faster. And Lewis has been doing that his entire life. So he's just, you know, an absolute pro. Yeah. How, how, how fit do you have to be to be like at the very you know top of this sport? It gets so hot. So in the open wheel cars, it's different. Like Formula One and Indy car, you're not in a cockpit. You are open and your head is open out in the air. It's much cooler. In stock cars, which is what I spent most of my career racing in, it gets incredibly hot in there. Um, so I've raced in Texas and I remember, so I have a guy that's like my tire guy and what he does is he looks at the, he has a little temperature gun that he points at the surface of the racetrack that will tell us how hot the racetrack is. And that helps him determine how he wants to set my tire pressures. And he pointed the temperature gun inside my car and it was 150 degrees inside the car. So you're sweating like crazy. In fact, I think Tony Stewart, who's retired now, but he was one of the famous NASCAR drivers. Um, he, they did an experiment with him where he, uh, they weighed him before and after a race and he lost 10 pounds yeah. of, of sweat, like water weight. People always ask one of, that's one of the common questions I got when I was racing is, do you ever have to go to the bathroom, you know, during those long races? And I'm like, no, you're sweating it all out. You would never have to pee in the race car because you're sweating like crazy. Yeah. Do, do you have the ability? Like, so typically in the races you did, how long were you in the car at, at so, a time? like Daytona was a 200 mile race. So it was, it's not as long as the guys that are in the top level, like cup, they're doing 500 miles. Um, but you know, it can, it can last for a couple of hours depending on wrecks and things like that. Sometimes we have red flags where you're just, you have to park the car on the racetrack while they clean up and you're just sitting there sweating like crazy. As I started to get up to the higher levels and get in better cars that with race teams that had a little more money, they, I did then have a system that was like an air vent that went into my helmet and blew a little bit of cold air to keep me cool. Um, but for most of my career, I was not with teams that that could afford those the expensive air conditioning systems. Wait, wait, in my you, mean helmet. Tell me, you mean to tell me vegan strong didn't take care of you like that with the vegetables? <laughs> Yeah, 150 degrees inside the car for, you know, an hour and a half or two hours was a little much, but I, um, I did a lot of hot yoga. That was something that I did all the time to sort of acclimate myself to being in intense heat yeah. and still being able to concentrate because I do remember there was a race I ran in North Carolina where I was so hot and it was so humid and it did affect my driving because I was so distracted by how 
you know, I felt like I was going to die of heat stroke, that it makes it difficult to drive if you feel like you're about to pass out. <laughs> how, would, how would you wear your hair? Because I would imagine your hair would affect the heat too. Could you put that up at all and have um, it behind you? So I would take my hair and it would be in a little ponytail and then it would be tucked into my fireproof racing suit. So we're way, that's the other thing that makes you sweat. We're in a three layer Nomex suit oh, yeah. that is fireproof. So I could be you know, in a fire or something like 30 seconds before I would burn. Thankfully, I, I never was in a fire. Um, and then you've got the helmet. So there's just very little air. It's just like you're baking in a sauna. So even though you're going 200 miles an hour, none of that wind is coming into the race car because the whole point is to make your car fast. You want to slip through the air as fast as possible. So the race car is shaped so that no air is coming in so that you're not getting the drag that you would get from air coming in through the window. So it's, yeah, it's, it's an intense amount of heat. Yeah. And then there's also a certain amount of claustrophobia that I'm sure that can potentially set in. I know from mm -hmm. being a firefighter, when you've got all that gear on, you've got your face, face piece on, you're breathing, right? You're breathing air and you get overheated and it, uh, it can be insanely uncomfortable. Yeah, I worked at a racing school for quite some time. And there, there was a couple of students that when we would get them all strapped in, you know, you're in this big harness, it's wrapping around your waist, it's coming up between your legs, and then over your shoulders. And then you have a head and neck restraint device that's called a Hans device, it prevents your neck from snapping when you take a big hit. Yeah. And then the helmets, so you can barely turn your head. And I had a couple of students that, you know, we got them all strapped in and they were claustrophobic and just climbed right out of the race car without ever actually driving it because of the claustrophobia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I can, <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I understand. Did um, you have claustrophobia a little bit? Well, I would say that I never ever did, but I had a couple moments where I was over like climbing 22 flights of stairs and, and these stairwells in, you know, Austin, Texas can be a hundred plus degrees. And then you're wearing these, these, these suits and you're in the, you know, the, the firefighting, you know, boots, uh, you got your helmet on, you're carrying 50 pounds of hose. Uh, it's so you're, you're just, you're taxing. It's so physically taxing. Mm -hmm. And then as, when you start to overheat on top of that, it adds a whole nother element. And you just, at some point you just want to tear off your, 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 you know, tear off everything that's keeping your skin from breathing, mm -hmm. tear off the mask. Um, but that's the worst thing you can do because obviously if there's, you know, smoke and stuff around. So yeah, I had a time or two that I definitely experienced, experienced some of that. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. I can't imagine, you know, some of the experiences that you have had and how, yeah. how frightening some of those must have been. Well, the, the fright, most frightening was I, I open up my first book, The Engine 2 Diet, with, mm, with this really crazy um, fire that we made where the, the person in the apartment um, died. Two firefighters got insanely badly burned. I was helping throw one of them or get him out of a second story window and lowering him down to the ground and then dropping him. But um, there was a flashover where everything in the room gets to a thousand degrees and it just basically light ignites. And uh, that's what happened. There was a flashover and there were, there was a firefighter in the room at the time and the participant, or I should say the homeowner. Um, and then one of the firefighters went in to save the firefighter. And then I helped drag them to the windowsill and then kind of basically throw them to the ground. It was, it was really, really awful really awful. Oh, that sounds yeah. terrible. Yeah. Yeah. You And did you get burned? I got some, I got some burns. Um, yeah. That actually you mentioned Nomex. It went right through my Nomex hood. And, oh, it did. And burned my ears and my neck. Um, one of the firefighters that was in there had 72% of his body, third degree burns had to be airlifted to San Antonio to the burn unit there. Um, it was, yeah, it, it was really a, a life altering fire for me mm -hmm. on, on, on several levels. Was that early in your career or? Later no, it, it, no, it was uh, th three and a half, four years into my career. 
Yeah. And it, and the thing with firefighting is, you know, you never know when that you're going to get a, a real doozy of a fire like that. And this one came in at about two thirty three AM, you know, so you're, you're, you know, you're woken up from a dead sleep and now you've got this fire, you've got, you know, all, you know, hell is um, just all hell is breaking out and uh, people are screaming and yelling and these, you know, the, when this thing flashed over, it went from looking like a little hibachi fire to all of a sudden you've got 30 foot flames that are coming out of this apartment complex. And you're like, whoa. And we got, we got some real shit on our hands right now. Wow. That yeah. is intense. Yeah. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time to go up this ladder and kind of shine my flashlight in and wave and yell and then get help get these guys to the windowsill and, and, and get them out. So you saved um, their lives. I, I, I certainly helped. Yes. 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 That must be a, such a rewarding feeling. <laughs> um, at the time it didn't feel rewarding. It just felt like I was, I was just doing my job, but um, yeah. Yeah. You're a hero. No, well, you know what? He, you, you, according to Glamour Magazine, were the eco hero. You're the <laughs> eco hero, and and we need more eco heroes on this planet. Uh, yeah. Hey, before before we wrap this thing up, um, I want to say that we just got a we just adopted a little um, a little baby cat. Oh. Yeah, a little black cat, and we're trying to figure out a name. You have a cat named Timbo, right? Yes, we have so, three three adopted kitties. Wow, he's so one Timbo, of the three. Timbo's a great name. We're trying to decide right now between French fries, Friday, Velvet, and um, and pickles. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. I've got th- I've got <clears throat> I am not child free. <laughs> I I have. I have three children, seven, 12 and 14. And, uh, and so it's fun. It's fun trying to figure out what to name the cat because before, and before we name her, we want to get to know her, know her right. personality a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with Tim. We, we came to Tim's name after we got to know him. We were like, he's definitely a Timbo. Yeah. yeah. You have to get to know their personality a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. And black cats are the least likely to be adopted. So our other two are um, our two adult black cats that we adopted because for some reason people yeah. think black cats are bad luck, which they are not. Yeah. Um, but but you're definitely saving a life by getting a black kitty because they're the, the ones that are most likely to be put to sleep of all the colors. Well, we didn't even know that, but thank you for 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 having two. And, uh, and for letting us know that. And I'm sure, but just by listening to this, we'll get more people adopting black, black cats. Yeah. They're wonderful. We love yeah. them. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to say is, um, I just think it's so wonderful. Um, first, let me say your mother, you, I know you posted a, a photo of your mother on Instagram recently. So beautiful to see, you know, your, your mother and where you came from. Um, there was also a great photo of your father that I saw, and I can't remember where I read it, but I just want to say that, you know, when you, I love that your father supported you uh, in, in, you know, racing cars. And, and can you tell the story of what, what he said to you when he, he flew, he <laughs> flew, I think to California to, to say two things to you. And what were those two things? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when I broke it to my family that I wanted to drive race cars and that this was something I was going to do, I got so many different reactions. One sister sent me, you know, a couple page email about why I shouldn't and how dangerous it was. And one of my other sisters was go for it. I think it's super cool. And my dad just sent back an email that said, I love you and I'm coming to visit. And he got on a plane. (laughs) He flew to LA where I was living at the time and we had lunch and he, he, sort of tried to talk me out of it and said, you know, when I was working as a resident and in the emergency room and I saw all these horrific traumas and he was kind of highlighting the risk that I was taking. But then when he got done doing that pitch, he said, okay, I felt like I had to do that as your dad, but I knew that you were going to race anyway. So I just have two requests. 
one, don't cut your hair off, and two, paint your race car pink. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever, did you ever have a pink race car? I had a race car early on that was white and pink and purple. <laughs> so it did happen. And I did have a racing suit that had some pink on it. Um, the, my favorite race car was my green, my bright green vegan strong car that was just, it was glowing on the racetrack. It was very easy for my spotter to spot me, which we, we have these spotters that sit at the top of the racetrack and they're sort of your eyeballs and, um, and the vegan strong race car is just beautiful. In fact, I would like to send you a little, uh, I have a little matchbox car size version of my vegan strong car. So I would love to send you one. I'll have to get your address when we, when we wrap oh, this up. I would be honored to accept that. That would be wonderful. Um, are you watching the Olympic games right now at all? Are you, are you a fan of that or not? I, I watched a little bit of it. I saw this one amazing, my favorite part of the Olympics so far has been the, the swimmer from Tunisia. Did you see this? <sighs> Yes, yes. That was the complete underdog, and he was like the slowest qualifier. The and outside just, smoke. Oh, it was amazing. They had video footage of his family watching that went viral because they were just screaming at the top of their lungs. And it was such a beautiful moment. So I, I love that, you know, it's always great when the underdog wins. It is, it is. Just like when I think her name is, <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to butcher it, but I'm going to say it. Well, I can't, I, I know her last, anyway, she's a little girl, the high schooler from Alaska that won the hundred meter breaststroke. Oh yes. I know who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what an underdog there to beat Lily King, the world record holder. Yes. It's great. It's beautiful. It's it beautiful is. to watch. I'm, I've, I've never been much of a, into watching sports. Even when I was racing, I didn't really watch. I, I would watch my race once after I raced just to see how much coverage, like, did they talk about my vegan giveaway? And, you know, <laughs> it, 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 did they talk about blackfish? Did they mention the dolphins from the cove? Cause I've run lots of documentaries on the car. Um, so it was always to see like, did they plug my cause? Um, but I'm just not much of a, of a sports watcher, but I love following sort of the viral, beautiful moments. I'm not going to sit down and watch the whole thing, but I'll, I'll, I'll watch the beautiful stories that come out of it. So and that's always, what I've been watching. Yep. And there's so many beautiful stories that come out of every one of these, these, uh, these Olympic games. Um, I, I want, I want you to know that. Um, so two of my three children just went to canoe camp up in the boundary waters Oh, um, yeah. yeah. And so we, we dropped them off there. Um, and then we spent uh, a week in Lutzen. I don't know if you've ever been to Lutzen, but it's on, no. on the North shore of this, of Lake Superior. Okay. And, uh, it's probably an hour and a half from, you know, Rochester, I think where you said, yeah, um, maybe you grew up, but, um, Oh, Lake Superior is a, just a beast of a lake. And, and I just can't believe how beautiful it, it is and the water temperature and the fact that 10% of the world's fresh water is right. Lake Superior. Um, oh, it's what, what a resource you yeah. have right there. <laughs> That's wonderful. You got to spend some time there. Yeah, it was great. Uh, well, this has been an absolute pleasure. I can't tell you how, how much I've enjoyed this conversation and uh, I feel so lucky to have to have met you um, and, and to hear your, the causes that you're fighting for that are all so, so noble and causes that are worth fighting for. Um, so, yes. you know, I'm, I'm behind you hundred percent on every one of these. And um, thank you, Leilani, for, for being who you are. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was such an honor to meet you. And um and when, when you said there's still a lot left worth that's worth fighting for, that are those are the words that I hang on from Dr. Jane Goodall, mm -hmm. who I got to interview um, last week. And she always is one to bring hope to people. You know, I think we see so much bad news that it's hard to stay positive. And that's what, those are the words that I always hang on that she says, which is, 
there's still a lot left that's worth fighting for. And I keep that in mind every time I get down and feel like, you know, this mountain is too big to climb. How are we going to turn this around? And she always gives me so much hope. Nice. Nice. Jane Goodall. And then also, I think it was Sam from, uh, from Lord of the Rings that said, you know, Mr. Frodo, um, what do you say? Uh, there's some good in the world and it's worth fighting for. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I love, I love the Lord of the Rings. In fact, in my front yard garden, I have a little baby hobbit door and I've planted like, um, uh, some some creeping time that goes over the top and I put little you know uh, little fairy items so it looks like there's a little tiny hobbit living in my front yard <laughs> and my husband's from New Zealand so I actually got to go Perfect. visit the movie set if you're ever in New Zealand um, make sure you go to Mata Mata which is where they filmed um, the parts w- that take place in the Shire and they still have all those little hobbit holes and they've even built like a green dragon where you can go and have a pint of beer and they serve vegan food. Um, you can order for your whole hobbit meal to be completely vegan, which we did. Um, and that's just beautiful, wow. gorgeous place. Well, I'll have to write that down for something to do on my bucket list. Yes. It's important to have a bucket list. Because my family, we love the Lord of the Rings. Love it, <laughs> love it, love it, love it. Have you gotten to, um, I know you interviewed John and Tracy Stewart. Yes. Have you ever gotten to it, to talk with Stephen Colbert? Because he's like obsessed with Lord of the Rings. No, no, I never have. No, uh-uh. no. I think he had some sort of a bet going with John about going vegan for a certain amount of time. Interesting. I don't know what happened with that. We'll have to look it up, but they had some sort of bet going. And I think John won. And I think Stephen was supposed to go vegan or vegetarian for a certain amount of time. So maybe there's a way for you to work out a, an yeah. interview with Stephen. That would be, that would, that would be a lot of fun. Um, so Leilani, will you do my sign off? Yes. What is the right. sign off? Just follow me. Just follow me. Peace. <laughs> Then turn it around, engine two. Peace, engine two. Land strong. Woo, I love it. All right. With people like Leilani in the driver's seat on so many of these causes, I have continued optimism that we are moving the needle in the right direction on so many of these issues. And it starts with you. So from the bottom of my plan strong heart, Thank you for opening your minds and hearts to these conversations and sharing them across your channels. We may not have a race car like Leilani, but it is up to us to keep our foot on the pedal and our eyes on the road ahead of us. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for listening to the Plan Strong Podcast. You can support the show by taking a quick minute to follow us wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Leaving us a positive review and sharing the show with your network is another great way to help us reach as many people as possible with the exciting news about plants. Thank you in advance for your support. It means everything. Have you had your own Galileo moment that you'd like to share? What happened when you stepped into the arena and shed the beliefs that you thought to be true. I'd love to hear about it. Visit plantstrongpodcast.com to submit your story and to learn more about today's guests and sponsors. The Plant Strong Podcast team includes Carrie Barrett, Lori Kordowich, Amy Mackey, Patrick Gavin, and Wade Clark. This season is dedicated to all of those courageous truth seekers who weren't afraid to look through the lens with clear vision and hold firm to a higher truth. Most notably, my parents, Dr. Caldwell B. Esselstyn Jr. and Anne Cryle Esselstyn. Thanks for listening.